Luke chapter 24, and, and I don't know if you ever feel like things just aren't going your way. Like, like the, the message title says, perhaps like sometimes it just seems like life is falling apart for whatever reason. Maybe it's in total, right? Maybe, maybe you get too focused, like it can be easy to do on the world around us, and that can be super discouraging. Maybe it can be a, a job-related issue that kind of seems to take front and center of our mind. Maybe it can be, you know, something in your community or family or, or a relationship of some sort. But it seems like things just aren't going well. Well, today we're going to look at some principles from God's Word surrounding the resurrection of Christ that we can apply to our lives to help when those things seem to be true in our life. So we'll pick it up in verse 1 of Luke chapter 24. And uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 1, we read, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So, of course, this is right after Jesus was crucified, right? He was laid in the tomb as we studied last time. And now we're, we're on Sunday morning, right? And verse 3, then they went in, right? So they went to the tomb, the, the, the stone. And this isn't just, you know, like, uh, you know, some little rock, right? This is a, a stone that would have taken several strong men to roll into place. And, and usually there was a little kind of crevice they put outside of the, the entrance. So it's not only like rolling on a flat surface, but they roll it kind of down and in. So this would have been a significant effort for a human anyways to roll out. And um, so they find the stone just rolled away. And they went in and they did not find the body of Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, so two angels, right? Uh, they said to these two men, why do you seek the living among the dead? Interesting, right? They came looking for Jesus to anoint his body who had been crucified just a few days before and his body's not there. And these angels asked this question as if it's just something that they should have known they said, why, why do you seek the living among the, the dead? Verse 6, he is not here, but is risen. But remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, and of course, you know, you'll see there the words read, so quoting what Jesus said, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. So reminded them what Jesus said. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And, and so, you know, here they, they go out early, they encounter this, this, these angels, they run back, and they're telling the other, other apostles, verse 11. And, and as you can kind of understand, right, their words seemed like idle tales. Right? It seemed like a tall tale to them, and they didn't believe them. So think about that, right? In spite of the, the, the many times Jesus had shared that he was going to, you know, be, die and rise again, they didn't believe. But verse 12, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself, what had happened as if it clicked, right? Marveling, which who, who wouldn't, you know? Like, man, what's, what's going on? It sort of rocks their world. Pick it up then, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked of all these things that had happened. So just a few days, it's like, you know, something major happens. I mean, a, a major... Uh, event happens. Maybe it's a big sports win. Maybe it's a, some significant crime. Maybe it's some political thing, right? But some major event happens and how it's sort of the talk of the town, you might say. Well, Jesus had been crucified and there was a lot of expectation, a lot of uh, uh, expectation about what, what he would do and anticipation about 
you know, that they were there for the Passover and the celebration of the Passover, and then all these things happened. And so that's sort of the talk of the town, and that's the things that they're that they're talking about. Verse 14, that it happened. Verse 15, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So these two disciples, right, we'll, we'll see one of their names. It's not one of the, uh, neither one of them are, are of the 11, right? They're walking on this road to Emmaus, right? And, and just talking about what's going on. Like we might be talking about, you know, the election coming up or what's going on in our kids' lives or whatever, right? So Jesus comes up and he, and he starts walking and talking with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. So they didn't realize who it was that was walking with them. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Right, so they were, they were sad, they were discouraged about what had, what had been going on. And he asked them, what, what's going on? And so verse 18, then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there these days? I mean, all, all this talk about what was going on and, and Jesus being crucified and, you know, the, the, the trial, all these things that were starting to make its way around, right? They didn't have, you know, social media, right? Where the people just jumped on and saw these things. It's, it's making its way around. And, but they say, man, did, are you the only one who's not aware of what's been going on? Sort of sort of bewildered by this. In verse 19, he, Jesus, said to them, well, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, right? That was, that is the key of what the disciples had been longing for, what they had been expecting was Jesus to deliver them politically from the Roman rule. Uh, verse 21, uh, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So it had been three days, right? There had been talk, right? Jesus had shared about three days. There, there were uh, some of the Roman leaders, like we, or, or the Jewish leaders rather, that had gone, we know from other gospels, they had gone to uh, Pilate and they wanted an extra guard put by the tomb because they said this, this, this criminal, right, talked about rising again in three days and we don't want his disciples to basically stage it. So they had extra guard there. And um, so it's the third day now, these disciples are acknowledging, yes, Verse 22, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And so, you know, they, they noticed the Bible we just read said that the two men or the two angels appeared to them and they're saying, well, it was a vision of angels. So they're, they didn't quite realize what was going on and, and said he was alive. Remember how, how the, uh, the disciples didn't believe the ladies who had gone to the tomb. Um, and certain of those who were, were with us, verse 24, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see, which is, which is what they had said. Then he, so this is Jesus, right? And this is this beautiful. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And look at verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures all the things concerning himself or, or concerning the Messiah. So what's, what scriptures would they be talking about? Of course, the Old Testament, right? And so imagine, and, and they still don't realize it, they'll, they'll realize it in a little bit. They're not realizing who they're walking and talking with, right? Imagine that. And now they're going to get the, a Bible study about the Messiah from Jesus walking along the road, right? Think about that. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. And uh, let's continue on the, to verse 35, and then I'll, I'll get to our, our, the point we're going to pull out of this, right, for our, our, our topic of when life seems to be falling apart. Because to these folks, as we just read, life was shattered, right? They, they were devastated. They were hoping for this deliverance. 
right? Little did they know they were in fact being delivered, but from something much greater than just, you know, political oppression, which they felt from the Roman government, they were be de being delivered or having the opportunity to be delivered in a much greater way. So, um, verse 28, then they drew near to the village where they were going. So, right, they were on their way to Emmaus. They drew near to the village. It's getting close to dusk, we'll see. And he, that is Jesus, indicated that he would have gone further. So it was, you know, kind of like they're walking and they're getting close to like, you know, like you're walking with somebody and, you know, one's going down this hall. You kind of start to part. And they're like, and so, so they, they said to him, they constrained him, saying, abide with us or stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in, and so he went in to stay with them. So it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, so they're now having a meal, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, or they realized who this was, and um, he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, verse 32, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and he opened the scriptures to us. Right? You, you, you've had that, right? You're reading God's word or you're, you're listening to God's word and man, it just, it just resonates, right? God is, is speaking to your heart, comforting you, uh, revealing a truth to you, uh, maybe giving some direction from his word, a principle that you can apply to whatever situation is going on. Maybe it's something that, and you, you probably, I'm sure you've had this where, you kind of go, I don't, okay, like something jumps out at you, but there's not really anything right now that's, you know, front and center. And then the next day or maybe later that day, it's like, oh, okay, you remember that principle. And um, so they said their, their heart burned within us. And so he rose up that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together. So the two disciples, as we mentioned, one's name is Cleopas and all the others that they were meeting with were none of the original 11 right because th this radical thing happens Jesus walks and talks with a couple of them they go in and meet with more they're getting ready to have you know they're hanging out sitting around a table Jesus gives them you know he blesses the food and uh, and hands it out and then they realize who he is and he disappears all of a sudden remember how they just said that the, the day is close to an end Man, that, that happens, and they're booting back to Jerusalem really quick, right? And it's not like they, you know, hop in the, hop in the car. They're, they're getting back to Jerusalem, and they go and they tell the other 11. So it was none of the original 11 that were part of this. And they said, the Lord is risen indeed and, and has appeared to Simon. Kind of interesting because they already knew that. They just told, the, the two just told Jesus that, right, that, that he had appeared, right? And um, they told him about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So, so in other words, they reiterated what just happened. And so when, when life seems to be falling apart, and as I mentioned earlier, whether it's you know everything all around you or, or it's some aspect of your life, one principle that, that I would suggest we take away from this passage and, we, and I'll share a, a few reasons why, is that you stay true to God's direction in your life, regardless of what is going on around. In this case, their world is pretty upended compared to what they were hoping uh, from Jesus, right? Uh, he was the Messiah, right? They uh, had acknowledged that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Peter declared, right? So they, they had some understanding, and then he's crucified and, he, and he's dead, right, in their mind. And, and they're walking and talking, and all these rumors start circulating that, well, maybe he, he's alive. And, and, and so, um, uh, it, it, but it seems like it's just the world is just upended. One thing that is important for us to do is to stay true to God's direction in our life. Look back at a few references here. Uh, verse 6. First thing, right? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. Right? Who, who said that? The, the angels. 
that appear to the ladies at the tomb point them to what? What Jesus said. Remember what Jesus told you. In other words, the word of Christ, the word of God, right? They, they point these folks to the word of God. And th this is a startling moment, right? This isn't later in the day. This is like stone, we, we were getting there, they're probably walking and talking, probably sad, you know, before light, you know, and, and they get there and, and the stones roll away. First sort of what's going on, they're expecting the guards, they're expecting the guards to have to roll the stone for them. And they go in and the body of Jesus is gone and these angels are talking to them, right? And, and the angels point them to the word of God. And then verse 25, fast forward, right? Jesus is walking with these disciples on the road. We've read that they're sad, they're discouraged, their life is turned upside down. And verse, uh, and they tell Jesus about what's going on. In verse 24, he says to them, that is Jesus, oh foolish one, interesting way to, have a conversation with people you just met, right, by the way, but, but oh, foolish ones, or that hadn't recognized who he was, right? They think he's a stranger just coming up to them on the road. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. What is he talking about? He's talking about God's word, right? Slow of heart to believe all that, all that the prophets have spoken, right? Over all these years, all, all their studying, Verse 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then what did he do? Beginning at Moses, right? Genesis, the beginning, right? And all the prophets, he expounded to them in what all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So to the women at the tomb, the angels point them to God's word, right? To the disciple and women, they were shocked. This is the first uh, uh, interaction, the first revelation, right? After Jesus has risen and they're shocked and the angels pointing to God's word. And then the disciples later in the day, they've heard about what happened to the tomb. They're skeptical, right? Not really quite getting there or believing. They're talking and down, we read earlier. And Jesus himself gives them a Bible study from the Old Testament, right? Shares about the Messiah, about himself, not revealing, of course, who he is yet, but he points them to God's word. And then uh, jump up to verse 32. And they said to one another, so this is after Jesus has revealed himself to them. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he did what he opened the scriptures, right? He, he taught them. He shared God's word. And, and he's applying, what he's doing is he's applying God's word for them, right? Teaching them about the Messiah. Things that have been there through all the centuries, but they didn't understand. He's revealing God's word to them. That's what, what, what we focus on at Calvary Chapel, right? We, we study and we encourage in your personal time with the Lord as well. We study through God's word. We look to see what it says, right? We don't get a pick and choose, right? God's word is God's word, every last piece of it. It's been said, and I believe it's true, there's a, an image or a picture or a type of Christ on every page, right? Jesus revealed cover to cover, right? And, and we, we, so we, uh, we teach the sense of it, right, as, as we read. Uh, and, and apply it to our lives. So what does it say? Uh, observe what's there, interpret what does it mean, and how does it apply to our life? Jesus is giving them, you might say, a Bible study during this time that is, to them, rocking their world. So stay true to God's Word. And the way that we can apply that is we have accumulated knowledge over the course of our walk with the Lord, whether that's six months or whether that's six years or 60 years, right? We've, we've accumulated a, an understanding. We've grown in a, a relationship. As we just read, he is not here. He is risen. 
So we have the honor of a relationship with Jesus Christ, God himself. And so as, as we go through life, we stay true to God's direction by living out the principles that he's re revealed to us in our, our time with him. We allow him, right, who, who has taken residence in our innermost person to live through us by living out what, what we know to be true. In Isaiah 55, uh, verse 8, we read, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. My, my thoughts are not your thoughts. His, his ways, not our ways. Right? Proverbs chapter 3, we read, um, To not, not trust in, in ourselves. Right? Jump with me over to Proverbs chapter 3. In fact, we'll, we'll read it. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. To, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean, right? That's what folks on. Don't lean on your understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path the way that you should walk. How, how is that? By, uh, by, by his word, by the things he's taught us, right? I, I, uh, I was reading earlier, I don't know, this month sometime, and someone said this interesting. One of the most destructive practices of our time is we value our own thoughts too much. We value our own thoughts way too much, rather than simply... What does God's word say? How, how should I live my life in light of God's word? Right? And we have our thoughts, but we just read in, in Proverbs chapter 3, not, not, to, not to trust in our, our own ways, but to trust in the Lord's ways. Right? So as, as we're going through life, stay true to God's direction in our lives. Open up God's word apply God's word to our lives, you know, I've, I've heard it kind of referred to as sort of the I think I feel, you know, type of people, right? And it's interesting, even in business, right? It's like uh, more and more about data, 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 right? What, what does the data say? And here's what we need to do, whether it's demographics for advertising, whether it's, you know, a price for a product, right? What does the data say? And then, and then apply that. As believers, as followers of Christ, what does God's word say for our conduct? You know, how, how should I live? Should I, you know, I have a decision in, in my job. You know, I could make this amount of money by not being honest, or I can make maybe less money by being honest. What do I do? Well, God's word says we're, we're not to lie, right? So we, we, we do what honors the Lord and we make a certain decision. Now, usually, very often, God will bless that. You know, I, I mean, I've been in a number of conversations lately. You were talking, uh, a friend of mine had, uh, unfortunately had some identity theft recently, and uh, just talking about the great links that people go to to steal, right? To um, do harm to someone else, to, to, to make money in a dishonest way if they simply applied their skill set and worked hard at being honest as, as they did at being dishonest, they probably have more money, right? How, and, and how many areas of society do you see that, right? And so we, we live out according to God's word. And of course, we, 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 we do that as, as his followers, those who have come to the place of realizing that, man, I, I fall short, I'm not perfect, I, I've sinned, I've fallen short of God's glory. I, I've turned from my sin and I've accepted Christ as my savior. And now I'm doing my best to live my life day in and day out staying true to his direction in my life. So that's the first principle, right? We, we stay true, right? When life seems to be falling apart, it can be tempting to try to, um, I mean, it's, I think it's important to, you know, we, we might need to adjust our course in some respect, but do it within the confines of honoring the Lord. What, is, what would God have for me? Secondly, as we pick it up in verse 36, right? Allow yourself to rest in the peace of God. 
right? When life seems to be falling apart, we don't have to be falling apart. Does that make sense? Things might be really difficult around us, but it doesn't mean that we uh, as individuals have to be falling apart just because the world is falling apart. Certainly the world has major, major issues right now, right? We, we're well aware of that. Doesn't mean that we have to lose hope. We shouldn't lose hope, right? So pick it up in verse 36. Now as they said these things, they were sharing about what had, what had gone, gone on, and they're back in Jerusalem, right? Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and he said, what? He said, peace to you. Right? He, he, he says peace to the disciples. And, and it's not like, you know, the door opens and Jesus walks in. There he is, right? So it's one of the, it's an unusual day for these folks, right? First thing in the morning, right? Three days ago, they, they had this, the terrible event of the crucifixion, right? In their mind, dashing their hopes for this deliverance that they were hoping for from the, the, the government. Now these rumors, three days later, that, that his body's gone, that he's risen, now some of the disciples are talking about how he talked with them on the road to Emmaus and how he, he was with them and then boom, he disappeared and they run back to Jerusalem and they're talking and then boom, all of a sudden here. I mean, this, this is a day, right? And the first thing he says is peace to you. But verse 37, their state of mind is you know, understandable. Maybe similar to how sometimes we can be. But they were terrified. And they were frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit, which in a sense, you can't really blame them. I mean, here they're, they're talking all of a sudden there's Jesus, right? He didn't walk in, didn't get lowered from the roof. You know, boom, there he is. And he said to them, why are you troubled? <laughs> I love that. You know, and he, he knows, right? But, but why are you troubled? Like, in other words, just, just relax, right? Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? And isn't that the issue so often for us, right? When, when life gets really hard, right? It, it can cause us to suddenly doubt God. I was talking with someone very recently about the idea that, uh, and, and they've been under some heavy um, challenges that somehow it's because God is angry. And if we're honest, we, we can get that sense too that life is rough because God's mad at me. Life is difficult because I've let God down. Rather than realizing, right, what the author of Hebrews says is don't despise the chastening or the correction, or you might say the training of the Lord, right? For those whom he loves, he corrects or trains. It's a whole different thing if, you know, you have a young child and they're, you know, going to put their a knife in the electric socket and you go over there and you knock it away or you slap their hand or whatever the case may be and from their perspective man I, you just spoiled their day but, but but the reality is you potentially just saved their life right and so is that because you're angry with them that's the same thing as when we look at God's correction in our life as punishment rather than realize that his correction is often training for us, don't go put knives in the sockets, whatever the case may be, right? Because as the scripture says, just as, as, as a father corrects the son whom he loves, right? So God, right, and, and we're imperfect, God corrects us so that we do better down the road, right? So rather than looking at trouble in our life as God being angry with us or upset with us or coming down on us look at it as the truth what I believe is the truth right we often think of lies like uh, a lie that somehow Satan is equal to God that that's a lie that some people tend to believe that uh, you know Satan is he is the opponent you could say of God but he's not an equal opponent of God. He's not an equal for, not even, I mean, not even in the same ballpark. He wants you to think he is, because what? If you think he is, then to you, he is, right? That lie becomes truth, and all of a sudden you think it's out of control. Oh, it's not out of control. God's firmly on the throne, right? So it's important that we are grounded 
in the truth that God is for you. God has your best in mind. That is the truth. Are there difficulties in life? Yes. Is it because God is angry or punishing me or dropping the hammer on me? No. Look at it as what it really is, is he's training you. Right? He's molding us in his image. We're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. Right? And so it changes everything. Right? Allow yourself to rest in the peace of God. And part of that is related to staying true to God's direction in our life, believing the truth. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, verse 39, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. He's saying, touch my, my hands, touch my skin, right? Because like we just read, they thought that he might be a spirit. When he said this, verse 40, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, in other words, like, what does that mean? They, they still did not believe for joy and marvel. They thought it was too good to be true. Some of you are sitting there or, or listening online, perhaps thinking, no, I still think that when things are rough, it's because God's mad at me. It's too good to be true that I just have to, you know, do what 1 John 1, 9 says. Right? It, 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 confess, if we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all. No, that's too easy, Steve. It's, it, that, that's too good to be true. That, that's kind of the idea here. Oh, it's, it's too good to be true. Right? The, 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 this is Jesus. Just like he said. <laughs> you know what I mean? Remember, for three days and three nights, right? Destroy this body, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And they're like, oh, how can you raise it up? It took us, uh, whatever, 87 years, whatever it was to build, you know, this temple. Oh, it can't be. Remember, he said, right? Just like he said. Uh, and so, but while they did not believe for joy and marvel, right? They thought it was too good to be true. He said to them, have you any food here? I like Jesus, right? <laughs> He wants to have some food, right? Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Again, was this for him? More than likely also to help them understand that this is him. I mean, it's not a spirit. Jesus, he's, he's risen just like he said he would. And so allow yourself to rest in the peace of God. Interesting, one, one commentator on, on that phrase there uh, that they, they didn't believe for joy says, Curiously, for the moment, joy, excitement, kept them from faith. Right? They, they, were, they were so excited that it kept them from, from faith. This may have been true in a sense that we may believe something is too good to be true, like we just spoke about. Yet it is also true that God wants from us a reasoned, thought-out faith, not a giddy, easy believism. Jesus wanted them to think and believe. Important, right? And so, as I mentioned, right, we, we stay true to God's word by growing in our understanding and our relationship with Jesus, by growing in our understanding of his word, our love for his word, and in, and in living that out. And because he's perfect, we're going to fall short. And we tend to think, well, yeah, I, I did that when I wasn't a Christian, but now I've been a Christian for a really long time, and I should probably know better. So God's mad at me, <laughs> right? We go back to God's mad at me. He's dropping the hammer. He's upset because I should have known better. When, no, you're his child and he's training you and he's guiding you along the way because he loves you, right? We, we, we change, we grow. So, so what is, well, we, we all have ways that God uniquely reveals to us his love, right? right? Something special, right, where you just go, man, that's the Lord. Maybe it's in nature, maybe it's some beautiful sunrise, and maybe it's what, what somebody says to you. Maybe it's um, a, a song that comes on the radio or a song that comes into your mind, you know what I mean? Or, or a scripture 
that God brings at just the right time or a word from a brother or sister in the Lord. There could be all sorts of different ways that God just reminds you that he loves you and he's for you. Look for those, enjoy those, right? Remember his blessings, remember his promises. I, I read uh, someone said that if God is in all the moments of our lives, if he is good and he is up to good in all the moments, and he is, God is good. Remember, that's a, that's a foundational truth of his word, that God is good. And it's important that we understand and we believe that he is up to good in our lives. right? In fact, he causes all things, and not all things are good. Some things are terrible. But he causes all things to work together for the good. Therefore, he is up to good in our lives based upon his word. So if he is good and he's up to good in all moments, then it more than stands to reason that each of us should be able to show and tell what good gifts the Father has been giving. Do you ponder those? Do you ponder the blessings that he showers upon you every day? The sunrise, oh, Steve, it's cloudy today. Oh, look at, look at the weather, right? The Eeyore mindset rather than the Tigger mindset, right? It doesn't take anything hard to be negative, right? But the sun is up. <laughs> we might not see it, right? Or, you know, the list goes on and on of the many, many great blessings. So allow yourself to rest in the peace of God. You know, and I, I was thinking about this because there's a lot in our culture that can drive towards lack of peace. Right, and in many ways, because much of, of our culture, uh, it pushes back on the things of God. It wants nothing to do with the things of God. Right, in fact, there, there are those that don't really stand for anything in particular, except you can't tell me what to do, and especially if you want to reference the Word of God or, or Jesus. Right, so, so let me ask you, who are the people that, that you interact with? Who are you? Who do you give the honor of influencing your thinking, right? Who, who do you give the ability to make your day or, or make your day terrible, right? Because we, we all have those choices as we, as we go to, through life and it can impact or, or distract from our peace with the Lord, right? We're, we're, we're encouraging us, right, to allow ourselves to rest in the peace of God. Jump with me over to um, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. In verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to encourage us. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you and I go to prepare a place for you, right? That sounds pretty personal to me. He's going to prepare a place for you because he loves you and he is up to good in your life. Are, are we intentional about what we allow into our mind? I remember when I read this verse, I don't know how many times, you know, and I, we were, I was in school of ministry Super challenging time in, in many, many different ways. God called us to go, us, because it's a kind of a family adventure. Um, when uh, uh, Josh was just turning three and Daniel was born a month later, right? So, so basically three kids in either diapers or, or pull-ups, just an interesting time, you know, and uh, a lot of challenges. And so through that, there was a food ministry that we were being blessed by at the time. And, you know, that, that took some, you know, adjustment for me. I didn't really like, you know, I, I love handing out food to people. I didn't really like to go get it, admit, you know, yeah, things are tough, you know. And I remember getting a box and then you're just excited or, you know, and and um, uh, in it was a little track and the front was John 14 one. Do not let your heart be troubled. And it dawned on me here, it was a time it was, was very difficult for me. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I, I, I learned to accept it and, and then to be very, very grateful for the provision because it was from the Lord. But it's the first time it dawned on me, this is a decision to make. Don't let your heart be troubled. 
Right? So I have to choose, am I going to be worked up about this or, or am I not? Right? Am I going to trust that God is on the throne and God is at work? Right? Am I going to choose peace? One thing I would strongly suggest if, if this is a struggle for you, and, and the reality is, it, is it, it is a struggle for all of us from time to time, right? Um, be, be intentional, not only about the people that you interact with, but, but be intentional about um, what you might call like your online time, right? Social media, it's interesting. I've sort of thought about that term, social media, and I use it. It can be used for great things. Um, it, it's a lot, can be a lot of fun. Right, but I think about, is it really social? <laughs> I mean, is social media really social? It's, it's a godsend for those right, who, who can't come out to church and, and maybe online, maybe they're, they're, they're bedridden. Maybe they're temporarily unable to get around. What a wonderful blessing, right? Absolutely wonderful. Or, or some days we're, we're sick and we, we need that. It, it's wonderful. But it can also be a huge source of a, a lot of... A lot of professionals link it to depression and different things because they can be such a source of negativity and, and uh, challenge in our life. And then, you know, is, is it really media? <laughs> like from the standpoint of like, new, I, you know, I, I think it's sort of an oxymoron in, in, in a sense. So, so be careful about that. We're designed for relationship. And like I said, that's a, that's, that can be a blessing. I've connected with friends that I otherwise just absolutely would not see, you know, from years ago. We're living across the country from each other. So there's great blessings. But, but be careful that it doesn't get too, too um, much of a grip on, on you. We all, we all want that interaction, right? We all want to know that, that, that we're seen, that we're wanted, that we're loved, our, our Hearts are meant to experience joy. Our hearts are meant to experience love. We all want to be part of a, of a bigger story. Uh, someone said, really, love is the greatest thing in the whole universe, and love is capital L, life, right? Conditional kind of love, it, it can be the source of some of our greatest wounds, some of our greatest hurts, right? When, when we realize we're, we're loved, if I'm doing the right thing or, or pleasing somebody, but, but I'm not really loved if I don't. The opposite though, unconditional love, God's love is the source of the greatest healing of all time. Realizing that God is for you, right? We, we are, are the most alive. We're, we're, we're thriving the most, right? When we are receiving love or offering love. Right? If we're always trying to be on the receiving end, we're going to be very miserable. Right? Jesus says he, did, he didn't, he even himself didn't come to be served, but to serve. He said that we, we find our life when we lose it, when we lay it down, when we're other-centered. Philippians, which uh, we'll, be, we'll be studying here shortly, right? We'll, we'll read about, about preferring others, putting others first, giving love, sacrificial love, right? Where we're being a blessing to others. We're most alive when we're, when we're giving love. And it, that, it, that can explain why we can often engage in unhealthy practices, whether it's online or, or other ways, to make life and love happen on our own rather than letting the love of God fill our hearts, rather than really letting the love of God sustain us, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way in a book many of you are familiar with called Mere Christianity. He said, God made us. He invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol. That was his time, but gas, right? A car is made to run on gas, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God, does, God designed the human machine to run on himself, his love. He himself is the fuel our spirits are designed to burn. The food our spirits were designed to feed on. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion or faith, right? Relationship with Christ. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it simply is not there. And when we're looking for happiness and we're looking for peace, whether it's in people around us or in 
a job or in situations around us, it's simply not there apart from him. Someone went on and said, much relational or relationship bankruptcy boils down to the manner in which we make withdrawals from one another rather than deposits into one another. Right? Are we looking to love others or are we looking to always receive love? Receive love, let God's love fill our hearts. Right? And then we're in a place to be able to, to, to give that. Right? And then last but not least, as we wrap up here, seek the Lord and pray for God's wisdom for understanding and, and power for living. Look at the last few verses here in verse 44. Then he said to them, Those are the, or these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So the Old Testament, right? And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and notice that he opened their understanding, right? James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely, right? So hence, seek the Lord, pray to God for wisdom and for understanding. And then for power, verse 46, uh, thus he said to them that it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance, turning from sin, remission of sins, should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the, the promise of my Father, right? The, the baptism of the Holy Spirit over in Acts chapter 1, right? Uh, upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So this is the end of Luke, right? Luke picks it up in Acts chapter 1 and talks about that, right? And, uh, the, the continuation of that. And he led them, verse 50, as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Radical change from the beginning of the, of the chapter, isn't it? Down, discouraged, seems like life is falling apart. They interacted with angels. They interacted with one another. They interacted with Jesus, right? And they were, they were pointed repeatedly to God's word, right? And, and, and they end up worshiping him, returning to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing the Lord. What a radical transformation. So just because it seems like the world is falling apart, which it seemed to them, and it might seem to us at times, remember to stay true to God's direction, to God's word in your life. Allow yourself to rest in his peace and then seek him for his guidance and for his wisdom and for the power of the Holy Spirit to live for him. As we close then, consider, do you believe that life is happening to you? Kind of the, the, the poor me, look how life is happening to me. Or do you believe that life is happening for you? That God is orchestrating circumstances in your life for your part of the bigger story that he is working on this earth. I hope that it's the second. I hope that you don't sit back and think that, man, life's just against me. Because life is not against you. Right? The world might be. Our flesh can cause us to struggle. There certainly is the enemy of our souls out there trying to destroy us. But you are part of a bigger story. We all are part of a bigger story. Right? So if you have the mindset that life is happening to you, oh, woe is me. Pray. Because I get it. There, there's hard things in life. Really hard things. Right? But pray and take the mindset that I believe is true from God's word, that life is happening for you. God has a purpose and a plan for you as part of his love story from beginning to end for all of humanity. Amen? Let's stand together.